Welcome to the 96th Annual Meeting of the American Psychological Association in Atlanta, Georgia. This is tape number 89-433-88. The Operant Side of Behavior Therapy. The speaker is B.F. Skinner. In the introduction of an eminent scholar in psychology, it is customary to make reference to his or her contributions to a specific area of expertise. For example, one might refer to a clinician's contributions in the study of depression or to those of a social psychologist interested in self-presentation. It is not adequate to do this with B.F. Skinner because his contributions, rather than having been restricted to a single problem or subset of them, have been to psychology as a whole. Although it is not always readily acknowledged, Professor Skinner is the most influential psychologist who ever lived. As evidence, let me describe some examples of his impact as recently summarized by Travis Thompson. In the laboratory, methods pioneered by Dr. Skinner are used not only in psychology, but also in physiology, pharmacology, neurochemistry, and toxicology, among others. These procedures continue to have wide applicability in psychology, having contributed materially to the study of such things as psychophysics, social interactions, drug effects, innate releasing stimuli, and many other important psychological phenomena. Such contributions as these alone would be enough to guarantee a unique place in the history of psychology for anyone. But B.F. Skinner's influence goes far beyond this. It is impossible to summarize briefly what Professor Skinner has given to our science, but as three quick examples, consider that his contributions include, one, his great 1945 paper on operationism, in which he challenged the field to conduct not a logical, not a metaphysical, not a phenomenological, but a psychological analysis of private events like thinking and feeling. That challenge remains unmet. Two, his tremendously thorough, insightful, and still widely underappreciated book on verbal behavior. It's a very difficult book, so difficult that a person with the perspicacity of Chomsky did not understand it. <laughs> And three, his conceptual and technological offerings in the book Behavior of Organisms, whose 50th anniversary we are celebrating this year and which continues to provoke thoughtful discussion, as evidenced by a symposium yesterday dedicated to it. One of the concepts described in detail in the Behavior of Organisms seems quite relevant to Professor Skinner's presentation today, the title of which is The Operant Side of Behavior Therapy. The concept is that of the operant. Because we have all lived with it for most of our professional lives, we may lose sight of the importance and impact of this concept. Essentially, it has provided the science of psychology with an effective and meaningful way to proceed in the study of behavior by providing a fruitful unit of analysis. It is an elegant concept, as almost all great ideas are. Its essence is that it is scientifically and practically useful to categorize behavior in terms of its function. That is to define it on the basis of how it affects or operates on the environment rather than on its specific form. What counts most is what behavior does or accomplishes. Less important is what it looks like. It matters little whether you turn your head or instead move your eyes when what it, the important end result is what you see. In a bold stroke, the concept takes the teleology out of purposive behavior. This concept not only has had a huge impact on the science of psychology, it has had substantial influence in everyday life. As noted by Thompson, tens of thousands of persons have been exposed to teaching machines and programmed instruction based on explicit application of the concept of the operant. More than three quarter million developmentally disabled persons are now in special education programs that use operant principles. More than 10 million people, and I bet a few hundred in this room, receive frequent flyer credits and millions of people have been treated by some of you for a variety of behavioral problems using procedures based on the concept of the operant. So firmly ingrained is the concept that you could hear the word reinforcement on the Today program. Even as, as even this short and far from, from complete summary shows, Professor Skinner's place, and it is a high one indeed, in both the history of our science and in the history of our culture is secure. Professor Skinner has argued consistently that psychology can be its own science, not simply a haven for those who wish they were neurophysiologists. <laughs> and as the foregoing sample of accomplishments has indicated, 
it is clear that a functional approach to behavior not only is not dead, as some erroneously continue to claim, it permeates our science. Dr. Skinner's innovations and conceptualizations are here for the long term. He can rest assured that the views he has championed be have become part of the psychological enterprise. I consider it a high honor indeed to have the privilege of introducing to you Professor B.F. Skinner. conservative introduction. <laughs> in 1913, John B. Watson issued his famous manifesto. The subject matter of psychology was behavior. It is easy to forget how radical that must have seemed. Psychology had always been the science of mental life. And that life was to be studied through introspection, a process of self-examination borrowed from the philosophers who had used it for more than 2,500 years. People behaved in given ways because of what they were feeling or thinking about. And feelings and thoughts were therefore the things to study. Seventy-five years have seen a great change. Introspection has been returned to the philosophers. There are no longer any trained observers in the Wundtian tradition, and cognitive psychologists no longer observe the mental processes they talk about. The processes are hypotheses to be confirmed either by inferences from the behavior they are said to explain or by a different kind of observation of the nervous system. Meanwhile, two flourishing sciences of behavior have emerged. Ethology is one of them. The behavior of animals in a natural environment is no longer explained by imagining what the animals are feeling or thinking about, but by the contributions their behavior may have made to the, to the future of their genes. In the other science, the experimental analysis of behavior, animals are observed in the laboratory where many of the conditions of which their behavior is a function, can be controlled. Most of the behavior is traced to operant reinforcement, a different kind of selective consequence acting during the lifetime of the individual. As more and more of the variables of which behavior is a function are identified and their role analyzed, less remains to be explained in mentalistic ways. There are proportionate gains in the application of the analysis. It has always been difficult to do very much with feelings or states of mind because of their inaccessibility. But environmental variables are often within reach. Contact between the basic analysis and its applications is therefore important. Although new facts often turn up in the course of applying a science, the science itself usually moves more rapidly into new territory. In what follows, I review some well-known practices in behavior therapy from the point of view of behavior analysis, and I discuss a few current theoretical issues. I do so not to correct or instruct practitioners, but to reassure them. 
the experimental analysis of behavior is developing rapidly, and at every step, the principles of behavior, the principles of behavior therapy appear to be confirmed and extended. Troublesome behavior is due to troublesome contingencies of reinforcement, not to troublesome feelings or states of mind. And to correct the trouble, we should correct the contingencies. Respondent behavior therapy. Psychotherapy has often been concerned with feelings, with anxiety, fear, anger, and the like. An early step toward behavior therapy was the realization that what was felt was not a feeling, but a state of the body. The point was made before the advent of behaviorism by William James and Carl Lange. Lange looked for possibly relevant states, but James put the argument in his best known form. We do not cry because we are sad. We are sad because we cry. A further step was needed, however. We do not cry because we are sad or feel sad because we cry. We cry and feel sad because something has happened. Perhaps a friend has died. We must know something about the earlier event if we are to explain either the crying or the state felt. That is the behavioristic position. Turn to environmental antecedents to explain what one does, and at the same time, what one feels while doing it. For every state felt, and given the name of a feeling, there is presumably a prior environmental event of which it is the product. Behavior therapy addresses the prior event rather than the feeling. What are felt as emotions are largely the responses of glands and smooth muscles. Efforts were once made to define a given emotion as a particular pattern of such responses. The variables of which the behavior is a function are a more promising alternative. Some aggressive behavior, for example, is genetic. It has evolved because of its contribution to the survival of the species. Variables of that kind are largely out of reach and dealing with the behavior of an individual, although aggressive behavior can often be allowed to adapt out. Much more can be done when emotional responses result from respondent behavior, Pavlovian conditioning. Troublesome behavior can then often be extinguished and other behavior can be conditioned to replace it. Such adaptation, both adaptation and extinction, have for unwanted side effects when stimuli are presented with gradually increasing intensities. The process is called, of course, desensitization. Operant behavior therapy. <coughs> Therapists have been as much concerned with what people do as with what they feel. Behavior therapists trace what is done to two kinds of selective consequences. Innate behavior to natural selection and learned behavior to operant reinforcement. A given instance is usually a joint product of both. There is an operant side of emotion, for example. Fear is not only a response of glands and smooth muscle, it is a reduced probability of moving toward a feared object and a heightened probability of moving away from it. Anger is a greater probability of hurting someone 
and the lesser probability of acting to please. Where the bodily state resulting from responding conditioning is usually called the feeling, the state resulting from offering conditioning observed through introspection is called a state of mind. Important distinctions are obscured, however. When behavior is attributed to a state of mind, behavior is attributed to, when, when behavior is attributed to a state of mind, an operant is strengthened. But when a response has reinforcing consequences, but subsequent responses occur because of what has happened, not what is going to happen. When we say that we do something with the intention of having a given effect, for example, we attribute our behavior to something that lies in the future. But both the behavior and the state introspectively observed at the time are due to what has happened in the past. Expectation misrepresents the facts in the same way. To take an awkward example, when a reinforcing consequence has followed something we have done, we are said to expect that it will still follow when we do it again. What is introspectively observed is the bodily state resulting from the past occurrence. When one stimulus has often followed another, regardless of anything we have done, we are said to expect the second whenever the first occurs. And that kind of expectation is a bodily state resulting from respondent conditioning. Terms for states of mind have never been very consistently used. The nervous system which bring our behavior into contact with various parts of our own body are not very efficient. And we cannot observe many states of the bodies of others, at least while they are alive. In any case, explanations of what of that sort must themselves be explained. We make no progress by explaining one state of mind as the effect of another. We must get back to something that can be directly observed and, if possible, put to use. That means, of course, the genetic and personal histories responsible both for the behavior and, in passing, the states of the body introspectively observed. Some examples. The operant side of behavior therapy can be illustrated by considering a few characteristic problems, in each of which behavior is traced to a contingency of natural selection or operant reinforcement rather than to a state of mind. Positively reinforced behavior is often accompanied by a state which we refer, report by saying that we are doing what we want to do, like to do, or love to do. There is a special reason why such behavior is often troublesome. The reinforcing effect of a particular consequence may have evolved under conditions which no longer prevail. For example, most of us are strongly reinforced by salty or sweet foods. Not because large quantities are good for us now, but because salty and sweet foods were in short supply in the early history of the species, and those who, thanks to a genetic variation, found them particularly reinforcing, were more likely to eat them and survive. The increased susceptibility to reinforcement 
then led to the discovery and processing of vast quantities of salty and sweet foods, and we now eat too much of them, and they turn to therapy for help. <laughs> An increased susceptibility to reinforcement by sexual contact would also have had great survival value in a world subject to famine, pestilence, and predation. And it now raises problems, not only for individuals, but for an already overpopulated world. A strong susceptibility to reinforcement by signs that one has hurt another person would also have evolved because such signs shape and maintain skillful combat. The boxer who shows, who shows that he has been hurt has, has taught his opponent how to hurt. The strong reinforcement of aggressive behavior like that of sexual behavior raises problems both for the individual and the world. Problems also arise from reinforcers which have never had any evolutionary advantage. Homo sapiens is not the only species to have discovered them. The reinforcing effects of alcohol, heroin, cocaine, and other drugs are presumably accidental. They are particularly troublesome when their use leads to the powerful negative reinforcers we call withdrawal symptoms. The craving from which an addict is said to suffer is a bodily state which accompanies behavior due to anomalous reinforcers. A different problem arises when a repertoire of behavior conditioned in one environment undergoes extinction in another. The relevant bodily state may be called discouragement, a sense of failure, helplessness, a loss of confidence, or depression. A different time, kind of depression follows when, having acquired a large and effective repertoire in one place, one moves to another in which it cannot be executed. The behavior is not extinguished. There are things one still wants to do, but appropriate occasions are lacking. The student who has acquired an effective repertoire in college may find no place for it in the world to which he moves upon graduation. The person who moves to a new city may suffer the same kind of depression when a repertoire appropriate to the old city does not work well in the new one. Addiction to anomalous reinforcers is quite different from the addiction that is due to certain schedules of reinforcement. The so-called variable ratio schedule is especially likely to cause trouble. It is a useful schedule because it maintains behavior against extinction when reinforcers occur only infrequently. The behavior of the dedicated artist, writer, businessman, or scientist is sustained by occasional unpredictable reinforcement. We also play games because our behavior is reinforced on a variable ratio schedule, and for the same reasons, we gamble. In the long run, gamblers lose because those who maintain the contingencies must win. As with behavior due to anomalous reinforcers, Gambling is an addiction in the sense that there is no ultimate gain, at least for most of those who gamble. Many troublesome problems calling for therapy arise from a fault in operant conditioning itself. The process presumably evolved because behavior was... Uh, sorry? 
because behavior was strengthened when it produced important consequences for both individual and species. The process could not, however, take into account the manner in which contingencies were produced. It was enough that consequences usually followed because they were produced by what was done. Conditioning, nevertheless, occurs when reinforcing consequences follow for any reason whatsoever, and accidental consequences yield the behavior we call superstition. We fall ill, take a pill, form a ritual, and get well. We therefore are more likely to take a pill to perform the ritual when we feel ill again, regardless of, of whether there was any actual effect. Superstitions stand in the way of better measures. Therapy is often a matter of, dis of destroying and the reinforcing effect of purely adventitious consequences. Aversive consequences are responsible for many kinds of problems. As negative reinforcers, they can have the, the faults we have just seen in positive reinforcers, and as punishment, their side effects may be severe. We learn to crawl, walk, run, and ride a bicycle, because getting around in the world reinforced our correctly doing so, but also because we were hurt when we made mistakes. That sort of punishment is immediately contingent on behavior and may reduce its probability of occurrence, but it can also suppress behavior in a different way through respondent conditioning. The situation in which the behavior occurs or some aspect of the behavior itself can become aversive and it can gain negatively reinforced consequences, alternative negatively reinforced consequences in the form of other kinds of behavior incompatible with the behavior punished. The punished person remains as strongly inclined to behave in way punished as ever, but escapes from the threat of punishment by doing something else instead. When punishment is imposed by other people, as it often is, it is seldom immediately contingent on what is done and works via respondent conditioning. The bodily state resulting from the threat of deferred punishment is named according to its sources. When punished by one's peers, it is called shame. When by a government, guilt. When by a religious agency, a sense of sin. One way to escape is to confess and take the punishment, but when the behavior upon which a deferred punishment was contingent is not clear, escape can be difficult. Merely incidental aversive contingencies generate unexplained feelings of shame, guilt, or sin. For the continuation of this program, turn your tape over at this point. Thank you. Here then are a few examples of troublesome contingencies of operant reinforcement together with a few states of mind in which the, to which the behavior is often attributed. Other examples could be given, the list seems endless, but these are perhaps enough to show the precision and power of the operant analysis. It does not follow, however, that behavior therapists should never ask their clients what they are feeling or thinking about. 
from their answers, something may be inferred about the contingencies responsible. Sorry. Asking such questions is, in fact, often the only way in which therapists can learn about a personal history. They lack facilities for direct investigations, and to investigate without permission is regarded as unethical. But asking about feelings and thoughts is only a convenience, the very convenience, in fact, which explains why people have asked about them for so many centuries. And we must turn to more accessible variables if we are to have a scientific analysis to use to do something about personal problems. The argument for operant behavior therapy is essentially this. What is felt as feelings or introspectively observed as states of mind are states of the body which are which in turn are the products of certain contingencies of reinforcement. Contingencies can be much more easily identified and analyzed than feelings or states of mind and by turning to them as the thing to be changed, behavior therapy gains a special advantage. An important question remains to be answered, however. How are contingencies of reinforcement to be changed? <coughs> Some of the conditions in which behavior lived, or of which behavior is a function, are under control in homes, schools, workplaces, hospitals, and prisons. Therapists may change them for their own purpose if they are part of a family, or if they teach, employ workers, or administer hospitals or prisons. Professionally, they advise those who do so. They help parents with their children or spouses with their spouses, they advise teachers, they suggest new practices in hospitals and prisons. They can do so because some of the conditions under which people live can be controlled. The word control raises a familiar theme. What right as a therapist to maintain the conditions of which a person's behavior is a function. The question is more often asked about the use of punitive consequences by governments or positive reinforcers by business and industry. If it is not so often asked about psychotherapy, perhaps it is because psychotherapists have not demonstrated any threatening power, or because, like Carl Rogers, they insist that they are not exercising control at all. The question is more likely to be asked of behavior therapists because their practices are more often effective. For example, <laughs> token economies in hospitals or prisons, for example, have been challenged primarily because they work. Food, even institutional food, is a reinforcer and, and can often be made contingent on behavior. That can be done to the advantage of those who are reinforced, but it is perhaps more often done to solve problems of management. The ethical question would seem to be cui bono? Who profits? Control is ethical if it is exerted for the sake of the one controlled. That principle could play a greater part in current demands for legislative action to prohibit the use of aversive measures by therapists. 
It is easy to argue for banning the use of aversives because they are unpleasant things. By definition, they are things we turn away from. And as punishment, they interfere with the things we want to do. But who eventually profits? The dentist's drill is aversive, but we accept it to escape from a toothache. We accept the punitive consequences of governments and religions in return for some measure of order, security, and peace of mind. When aversive consequences are used to stop the bizarre behavior of autistic people long enough to bring them under the control of non-aversive practices, they would also seem to be justified. But only if no other measures can be used. Too ready in a, an acceptance of positive aversive measures blocks progress along other lines. It is only recently that strong sanctions have been imposed upon child abuse by parents and the battering of spouses. And corporal punishment is only now being strongly challenged in some schools. We are not yet ready to replace a police force or close the Pentagon. Applied behavior analysis was committed to alternative measures, however, and we may hope that the problems of the autistic will soon be solved in better ways. The clinic. Homes, schools, workplaces, hospitals, and prisons are environments in which people spend a great deal of their time. Face-to-face -face therapy in the clinic is different. Only a small part of the client's life is spent in the presence of the therapist. Only a few reinforcers can be used. And most of the time, only to reinforce social, especially verbal, behavior. There is a great deal of mutual shaping of behavior in face-to-face -face confrontations, and some of it is possibly harmful. What the client does in the clinic is not of immediate concern, however. What happens there is preparation for a world which is not under the control of the therapist. Instead of arranging current contingencies of reinforcement, as in a home, school, workplace, or hospital, therapists give advice. Modeling behavior to be copied is a kind of advice, but verbal advice has a broader scope. It may take the form of an order, do this, stop doing that, or it may describe the contingencies of reinforcement themselves, Doing this will probably have a reinforcing effect. If you do that, you may be sorry. Traditionally, advice has been thought of as communication. Something called knowledge of the world is said to pass from therapist to listener. But a useful distinction has been made between showing by acquaintance and knowing by description. Knowing because something you have done has had reinforcing consequences is very different from knowing because you have been told what to do. It is a difference between contingency-shaped behavior and rule-governed behavior. But why is action taken? Children often do as they are told, because they have been punished when they have not done so. And something of the sort is suggested when therapy is said, uh, when in, in, in therapy, when it is said that the therapist should become an authority figure, perhaps that of a father or mother. But children also do as they are told because positive 
reinforcers have followed. Parents who, who contrive consequences having that effect are said to reward their children for doing as they are told. Teachers contrive similar reinforcing consequences uh, such as good grades or commendation to induce their students to study. There is no natural connection, however, between the behavior and its consequences, but the practice is, is justified on the grounds that genuine consequences will take over in the world at large. Very little of that sort of thing is suitable in therapy. The only reinforcing consequences which induce clients to continue to take advice are largely to be found outside the clinic. Therapists who resemble people whose advice has often proved to be worth taking have an advantage. Those who do not must work in other ways. In traditional terms, they must build confidence or trust. That one can sometimes, that can sometimes be done by giving bits of advice which are not only easily followed, but will almost certainly have reinforcing consequences. Face-to-face -face advice may also take the form of rules for effective action. The proverbs and maxims of cultures are rules of that sort. Rules are especially useful because therapists may not be available for help in solving future problems. Not every problem can be solved by applying a rule, however, and some therapists may need to take a further step and teach their clients how to construct their own rules. That means teaching them something about the analysis of behavior, and it is usually easier to do that than teaching them how to change their feelings or states of mind. Health. Psychotherapy is said to promote mental health in the sense of helping people feel well and think clearly. Behavior therapy promotes behavioral health in the sense that it helps people behave well, not in the sense of politely, but successfully. Is there an effect on physical health? What people do may have obvious medical consequences. What they eat, how much they exercise, how carefully they avoid accidents, whether they smoke, drink, or take drugs, how often they expose themselves to infections, what medicines they take, how well they follow medical advice, and so on. Operant behavior therapists can improve medical health by helping people manage themselves in beneficial ways. But is there an additional, perhaps direct, effect? Something of the sort is suggested when it is said that a given type of personality or neurosis is associated with a given type of physical health. If psychotherapists <coughs> can change personalities or neuroses, they should be able to change health. But personality explains nothing until we have explained personality and it, as an internal correlative behavior, a neurosis is no more useful than here than elsewhere. The person in personality once meant the mask worn by uh, an actor in a Greek play. It was something one spoke through, the person means. It defined him as a persona dramatis. The, the word neurology was invented in the early 19th century at about the same time as phrenology. Phrenologists claimed to locate traits of character in the gross structure of the skull and neurologists went further inside to the gross structure of the nervous system. The important facts then as now were what people did. 
behavior therapists turn to the contingencies of reinforcement responsible for the behavior that personality neuroses and the like are said to explain. To say that physical illness is due to stress, for example, does not explain the illness or point to any way of treated until stress has been explained. If people are under stress because, for example, there are too many things they must do, the things, must, the things they must do are the things to be changed. To do something about an illness due to anxiety, we must change the aversive con of the con circumstances responsible for what then is felt. Some of the illness said to be due to discouragement or despair may be allevi alleviated by restoring lost reinforcers. An illness due to hostility or fear by eliminating aversive consequences, especially in the hands of other people. Assertions of this sort do not imply a neglect of genetic factors. Behavior therapy is limited to changes which can be made during a person's lifetime. A very different relation between behavior and health is implied when it is said that a critically ill person simply refuses to die or that one with a favorable prognosis loses the will to live. Examples of that sort are said to show the power of mind over matter. They suggest that being healthy is something one does. An ancient metaphor of the medical profession may be responsible. We catch a cold or get the measles. Engaged in a war with disease, we are attacked. We have a heart attack or struck down. We have a stroke. When infections invade us, such much depends upon our resistance. But good health is not contingent upon behavior in such a way as to reinforce being healthy as a kind of action. How contingencies of operative reinforcement affect physiological processes is no doubt an important question. Can immunologic, immunological practices be conditioned, reactions be conditioned in the Pavlovian manner. For example, but should the behavior therapist try to find out? Physiology has a special appeal to those who explain behavior in mentalistic terms. It seems to show them what is really going on inside. And what one is really talking about. Cognitive psychologists have turned to brain science for that reason. Behavior therapists may also wish and to turn to physiology if they think confidence, if they lack confidence in their own methods. But those methods are equally objective. One cannot quarrel with the choice of medical science as a professional field, or even with philosophers who wish to examine their own minds through introspection. But for every behavior therapist who, upon discovering some fact about behavior, then turns and begins to look for a physiological explanation, there is one therapist, the fewer, to make further discoveries about behavior itself. Feeling well and feeling good. People usually seek both medical and behavior therapy because of how they feel. The physician changes what they feel in medical ways. Behavior therapists change the contingencies of which what is felt is a function. The distinction between medical and behavior therapy resembles a distinction between feeling well and feeling good. One feels well who feels a healthy body, free of aches or pains. One feels good who feels a body which has been positively reinforced. Positive reinforcers please us. 
we call them pleasant, and the behavior they reinforce a pleasure. <coughs> what is felt in that way is apparently a strong probability of action and a freedom from aversive stimuli. We are eager to do things which have had reinforcing consequences and feel better in a world in which we do not have to do unpleasant things. We say that we are enjoying life or that life is good. We have no complaints because complaining is negatively reinforced behavior and there are no negative reinforcers. Successful therapy builds strong behavior by removing unnecessary negative reinforcers and multiplying positive ones. Whether, these, those, whether those whose behavior is thus stronger live any longer than other people, they can at least be said to live well in another sense. Finding a world in which one can live well in spite of the infirmities of old age was the theme of enjoy old age, which I wrote with the collaboration of Margaret Vaughan. There are medical imperfections in old age which cannot be avoided. Aversive consequences are more likely to follow whatever one does, and reinforcing consequences are less, less often. But the world of old people can often be changed. So that in spite of imperfections, one can enjoy more of one's life and perhaps even live a little longer. Can something of the sort be done for everyone? My utopian novel, Walden II, published 40 years ago, was a kind of fictional anticipation of what came to be called applied behavior analysis, or specifically, behavior therapy. It described a community in which governmental, <coughs> religious, and capitalistic agencies were replaced by face-to-face -face personal contact. New members began by following simple rules and with the help of instruction and counseling, their behavior soon takes, is taken over by carefully designed contingencies of reinforcement. Both operant and respondent conditioning were used in therapy in World in II. Children learned to manage their emotions, for example, through desensitization. There is little or no negative reinforcement or punishment. Like all utopias, World in II tries to solve the problems of a culture all at once, rather than one by one. We shall probably not move very rapidly toward that kind of a better world, but it is, I think, worth consideration as a model. Every advance in behavior therapy moves in that direction because it begins by changing the world in which people live and then only indirectly what they do and feel. For thousands of years, philosophers have, have talked about the behavior of people with whom they have no, had no contact and about whose feelings and states of mind they could not ask. Instead, they have disembodied mental events and discussed them quite apart from anyone in which they appear. They have said that frustration breeds aggression, that greed overrides caution, that jealousy destroys affection, and so on. Statements of that kind are fairly common in current discussions of government, religion, economics, and the other so-called, but in that case miscalled, social Behavior, behavioral sciences. By rejecting feelings and states of mind, 
as the initiating causes of behavior and turning instead to the environmental conditions responsible both for what people do and feel while doing it, behavior analysis analysts, and with them behavior therapists, can approach the larger problems of human behavior in a much more effective way. A problem of great importance remains to be solved. Rather than build a world in which we shall all live well, we must stop building one in which it will be impossible to live at all. That is wholly a problem in human engineering. How are people to be induced to consume no more than they need, refrain from doing things which unnecessarily pollute the environment, have only enough children to replace themselves, and solve international problems without risking a nuclear war. The contingencies under which people now live are maintained by governments, religions, and economic enterprises. They are in turn controlled by fairly immediate consequences, which are increasingly incompatible with the future of the world. We need to construct relatively immediate consequences of human behavior, which will act as the remoter ones would act if they were here now. That will not be easy, but at least we can say that we have a science and a technology which, is a, which are addressing themselves to the basic problem. Thank you. This portion of the program is now concluded. Thank you.